Big thanks to Ren for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description below to calculate and offset your carbon footprint. Hello there, my name's Bart, and in this two-part mini-series, we'll take a look at a really cool way of visualizing the building blocks of quantum computers. If you enjoyed these videos, then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe, and hit that bell button for more fun physics content. Let's get right into it. So, first things first, let's figure out what makes a quantum computer different from a classical computer, the kind that are commonplace these days. Classical computers use bits, or binary digits, to store data. A bit can be any system that could be in one of two possible states, often referred to as zero and one, or on and off, or yes and no. The exact names we give these states don't matter, so we'll stick with zero and one for this video. Usually, these are made from little transistors within the computer device. We can then use the states of lots of bits to store information. For example, we can store letters by using a binary representation of each one. 00001 could be A, 00010 could be B, and so on. This isn't necessarily the exact convention used, but that's the principle. Lots of bits together can be used to store data, and changes in these bits can be used to do complex computing tasks and calculations. Now, a quantum computer uses the principles of quantum mechanics to provide additional possibilities for computation and speed. Specifically, it does not use classical bits. Rather, a quantum computer uses quantum bits, or qubits. Yeah, scientists in this field really like to squash words together to make new ones. Qubits, just like classical bits, can be found in the zero or one state. But what's interesting about qubits is that when we are not making a measurement on them to figure out what state they're in, they can also be in a superposition or blend of the two states. This sounds really strange, but we'll understand this in more detail shortly. Qubits can be made up of any quantum mechanical system, basically any small system that has two possible states. We'll take a look at a couple of these examples later on in the video. But first, I want to take a moment to thank the sponsor of this video, Ren. We're all familiar with the climate crisis at this point, and I think that there's something we can all do to help, whether that's encouraging companies and governments to take this issue seriously, or actually reducing our own carbon footprints. I'm continuing to take small steps to change things up and reduce my own carbon footprint, such as walking more than driving, cutting down on meat consumption, making responsible purchases, and so on. REN is a simple but effective way of making a difference in the climate crisis. Their website, linked below, allows you to calculate your carbon footprint and then gives you ways of reducing it. You can also make a monthly contribution to offset your carbon footprint by funding diverse carbon reduction projects like tree planting, mineral weathering, and rainforest protection. REN will then meticulously quantify what impact each project is having and send you monthly updates so you can be sure it's making a genuine difference. Here's the thing, REN very carefully vets the projects that they work on so that the money being spent on them by members is allowing positive changes to happen that would have otherwise not been possible. Basically, in order for REN to work on some project, it needs to have a measurable impact, so we know exactly how much carbon dioxide is being offset, and that it stays out of the atmosphere for a long period of time as well. REN is a benefit corporation with a legally binding charter, meaning their work is as transparent as possible. So, if you'd like to calculate your carbon footprint and find out more about REN, please check out the first link in the description box below. It helps the channel out, of course, and the first 100 of you to sign up to REN using my link in the description box will get the first month of your subscription for free. So, please do check out the link down below. Big thanks to REN once again. Now, let's get back to the video. So, coming back to our qubit. How can our qubit be in a blend of two states? Well, the easiest way to understand this is to describe our system using some very basic mathematics. Every quantum system can be described by a wave function, which is basically a mathematical function that contains all the information we can know about our system. We usually represent this with the Greek letter psi. The line and the pointy bracket here are just a way for us to know that we're talking about a quantum state rather than just a number that we called psi. So in this case, our psi, our wave function for our qubit, is going to be equal to some form of superposition or blend of the zero state and the one state. We can write this using the zero state and the one state, but there's a bit more of a subtlety to it than that. We actually need to include some numbers here, a and b. What these refer to is the following. 
If we take either of these numbers and we square it, technically we find it's square modulus, then this gives us the probability of finding the corresponding state when we finally measure the system to find out what state it's in. If it's 100% likely that we'll find our system in the one state, for example, then a is zero and b is square root of one, which is one as well. But if we've got a 50-50 chance of finding either state when we measure it, then a and b are both equal to the square root of 0.5. And in between making these measurements, these values of a and b can change over time based on the Schrodinger equation. More about that in this video up here. I'll also link it in the description box below. As soon as we make a measurement though, the state of the system immediately flips to one of the possible measurement result states randomly. But the likelihood of it falling into one or the other is given by the square of A and B that we've just looked at. This is why we say that the system is in a blend of the two states. Because even when we just measured our system to be in one of the possible states, a short time later, it could be found in the other state. And the crazy thing is that doing the same experiment on exactly the same states at the same time could give different measurement results. This is a strange quantum mechanical idea that doesn't follow what we call common sense. Why does it have to be in some sort of weird mix of the two states? I've discussed this in more detail in this video up here, also linked in the description box. Now, we know that finding the square modulus of A and B gives us the probability of finding the system in either zero or one at any given time. And probabilities have to be positive. So these square moduluses also have to be positive. But interestingly, this does not place restrictions on the values that A and B can take. Since we take the square moduluses of A and B to find the positive probabilities, the values of A and B themselves could be positive or negative. You can take a negative number and make it positive when you square it, right? So why do we need the modulus bit at all? Well, it's because our values of A and B can even be complex. Complex numbers have an imaginary component to them, where imaginary numbers are basically multiples of i, what we've defined to be the square root of minus one. In high school maths, we're often taught that you can't find the square root of a negative number. But later on, we realize that if we define this strange imaginary number to be the square root of negative one, then we can basically find the square root of any negative number and open up a whole new branch of maths in the process. As we said earlier, complex numbers are made by adding together a real number and an imaginary one. Again, these are just naming conventions. This is just what we've called them. The fact that we use the words imaginary and complex doesn't actually mean that much. But the interesting thing is that we treat imaginary numbers slightly differently to real numbers. You know how real numbers all fit on a number line, for example, three or negative 45.92 or one million? Well, imaginary numbers have their own number line. And we can do some very interesting maths and physics if we imagine that this imaginary number line is at right angles to our real number line. This way, complex numbers can be considered a point on this two axis graph, some real number plus some imaginary one. This idea will come in handy in part two of this mini series. But let's quickly come back to our qubit then. These values of A and B essentially tell us how likely we are to find our system in either of the measurable states. In other words, our system state can change over time, as is usually the case. This change in time is dictated by the Schrodinger equation. And in the next video, we'll see how to visualize our system flowing back and forth between being in the zero state, being in the one state, and being somewhere in between the two, or in some blend of the two. And remember that it's being between these two states that leads to interesting quantum behaviors. Normal computer bits, classical bits, can already be in either of the two states, but not in between. Now, what we've talked about so far is quite theoretical and difficult to imagine in real life. And what I personally find helpful is to imagine a real system that behaves like this. It's all well and good thinking about some abstract system flowing between two states, or thinking about it as a combination of those two states. But what in real life actually behaves like this? Well, there are a few different ways to create qubits in real life, actually. Let's talk about a couple. Firstly, let's think about two energy levels that electrons can transition between within an atom. We can say that when an electron is in the lower of these two states, that it's in the zero state. And when it's in the upper of these two states, 
that it's in the one state. And when we're not measuring what state it's in, it's in some sort of superposition of the two. Now it's surprisingly difficult to build the exact right conditions for multiple atoms to interact with each other and have single electrons in two level systems. The atoms need to be cooled down a lot, external influences need to be eliminated, etc, etc. I'll leave some more information about this in the description. But getting one atom to behave like this for a long period of time is difficult in itself. Doing it for multiple interacting atoms is harder and harder. This is why building quantum computers in real life is so hard. Another example of a qubit is the spin of an electron. We may be familiar with the idea that electrons have a property called spin, and that this spin can take one of two directions when measured. We call these spin up and spin down, but we can also call them zero and one. Now it's worth noting that qubits have a lot of theoretical applications, and a few that aren't quantum computing related. My aim in this video was to provide a basic understanding of what a qubit is, and how we deal with it in the theory of quantum mechanics. In the next video, we'll look at how to visualize the change in a qubit state over time, as well as why qubits are actually useful in quantum computers. And we'll look at what we can do with them that we can't do with classical bits. So if you'd like to see that, then subscribe for more fun physics content. Also, please do hit the like button and the bell if you enjoyed this video. Check out my merch linked in the description. It features a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Albert Einstein. And finally, a huge thanks to all of my Giga patrons and all of the others over on my Patreon page. That's linked down below in the description as well if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you very soon.